Good morning, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're here today, as you know, to discuss uh, the trade war, global directions, local implications. I'm Gwen Robinson, a senior fellow at the Institute of Security and International Studies at Chulalongkorn University and editor at large of the Nikkei Asian Review, a regionally focused publication and web website. Um, before I introduce our, our panelists, uh, as you know, since the US imposed uh, tariffs on solar panels and washing machines against rivals, cheap arrivals from South Korea, China and elsewhere, um, the US-China trade war has been bitter and divisive, amplifying uh, starkly different attitudes, I think generally, towards uh, China on one hand and the US on the other. But the international impact beyond China and the US per se is far more mixed uh, and has divided regions and countries and created unlikely winners and improbable losers. In Asia, we're seeing many countries, industrial sectors and individual companies emerging triumphant or losing out from the fallout. But we're also seeing a lot of warnings now that if the trade war drags on, some predict another 20 years, the entire world will ultimately suffer from slowing growth and increasingly combative trade dynamics. So our export, expert panel today, uh, I know, is are going to bring insights into this broader and deeper uh, geopolitical, macroeconomic and regional effects of the US-China trade war on everything from security to supply chains. So just to introduce in the order of our speakers, to my right is Dr. Titinan Pongsudirak, Director of ISIS Thailand in the Faculty of Political Science at Chula University. And uh, next to him on the far right is Dr. Supervud Sai Chua, who is advisor to the Kyatnakin Patra Financial Group. Um, on my uh, right, on my immediate left is uh, Kun Pimchanok Vonkoporn, Director General of the Strategy and Policy Office in the Ministry of Commerce of Thailand. Uh, next to her is Dr. Pavida Pananon, um, Associate Professor at the Tamasat Business School, Tamasat University. And uh, last but very not least is Dr. Don uh, Nakontab, uh, Senior Director of the Economic and Policy Department of the Bank of Thailand. And before I start, I would just like to thank uh, Friedrich Neumann Stiftung and uh, I think uh, Dr. Pinrapat, if uh, you're here, uh, for uh, sponsoring this event uh, and making this possible. So without further ado, I would like to turn to our uh, experts and uh, invite each panelist to give an overview uh, from their perspective and uh, we'll leave time for questions at the end. So please uh, save up your hard hitting questions and um, uh, ask them uh, at the end. So I think we'll start with you, Dr. Titinan. Thank you, thank you, Gwent, and uh, thank you for agreeing to uh, moderate today so that I can uh, be a speaker. Look, uh, we have a rather short time, so we won't speak for more than 15, 20 minutes each in order to leave some time for the audience. Uh, for academics, scholars, students, uh, think tank hacks like me, uh, this is an exciting time to be working on international affairs. It's an exciting time. So much is happening. And, uh, you know, daily headlines, a lot of drama. Uh, however, it's not a good world we're in. It's sobering, alarming what's been happening. And then it's going to get worse. I think it will get worse. So I have just a few points. I've drawn up just one, only one PowerPoint slide as a kind of a outline. Uh, I just want to make six points. Uh, first, you know, what's happening with the trade war? The trade war is certainly much more than about trade. Uh, we've been talking about the maintenance of uh, you know, this, this liberal international rules-based liberal international order. The trade war has undermined, eroded uh, this order. And ironically, it has been uh, perpetuated, perpetrated by uh, the United States, uh, you know, who has initiated this trade war. And the United States is the one that uh, kind of constructed this post-war liberal international order. Um, so it's order eroding, uh, and there's a kind of a war behind the trade war. Uh, we have to ask, you know, how come, I mean, why suddenly in November, December 2018, we now have a, 
a fierce, virulent, intensifying trade war between the two largest economies in the world. There was not a sign of this two, three, four, five years ago. Uh, so if you, if you look back uh, into this confluence of factors that, that uh, became the en enabling environment, um, you saw that uh, when President Donald Trump, before he was elected, he campaigned on, you know, on his America First, reshoring, bringing American companies uh, back home, reviving uh, manufacturing and so on. And this coincided uh, with the timing uh, of China's uh, rise, China's uh, dynamism, China's expansionism, uh, especially in the South China Sea, and then to also the China's Belt and Road. So on the one hand, the US, Trump promised a lot. He promised to, to revive American economic strength. China was going places, it was expanding. And then you had these personalities behind the Trump team. Um, you know, you can see, I think Dr. Don uh, will, will uh, put up some photos, but you know, at the White House, uh, through the, the cabinet, uh, some key people who also have been kind of anti-China, anti critical of uh, China's rise, China's uh, uh, expansionism. Uh, so this confluence of different factors enabled uh, the environment to, 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 to take shape. Trump came to Asia last year for a 12-day tour for the summit season. We just had a summit season here. And uh, that Asian tour of Trump, he lasted 12 days. If you go back and look you know, at the APEC summit, the East Asia summit, and so on, uh, they were looking for a platform. Uh, so the, the Indo-Pacific uh, became a kind of a, in terms of timing, it became the convenient uh, platform because it was a departure from the pivot and rebalance of Obama and it gave the Trump team uh, something to work with. So you know, they came and he started talking about the Indo-Pacific. And pretty soon after the trip, the Indo-Pacific was codified into the US uh, national security strategy in December 2016, uh, 17, and then in January 2018 uh, was incorporated into the US uh, national defense strategy. So uh, suddenly, the Indo-Pacific became the real deal. Right, and then they began to uh, make some moves, uh, changing the PACOM, Pacific Command, the name into the Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, so that's the first point I want to make. You know, this this uh, uh, trade war uh, has much more to it than just trade, and is uh, eroding uh, the liberal international rules-based order that the U.S. Uh, ironically constructed uh, primarily after World War II. So beyond trade, um, you know, this is a. Uh, uh, a battle, uh, a competition rivalry that extends far beyond trade. And you will see that uh, in the recent summit's uh, statements, I mean, uh, it's really alarming what's, uh, what Xi Jinping said, what Mike Pence said, and uh, the, message, the messaging from the White House. Uh, we're seeing a full-fledged confrontation now between the U.S. and China. Um, beyond trade, you see that the U.S. is peddling now in full steam the, the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, the role of the Quad, the four countries, the you know, U.S., Japan, Australia, to a lesser extent India. Uh, this is an extension, expansion from revival as well from the uh, trilateral security dialogue, became the quad quadrilateral security dialogue, and now it's in, back in full swing. Um, the Seventh Fleet, the you know, U.S. Uh, Indo-Pacific Command, is much more active now in the, in the region, South China Sea. They're testing uh, uh, China's uh, resolve uh, you know, around these uh, artificial islands that, that have been weaponized, that have been built by China. So we're seeing a lot of tensions in the South China Sea. Uh, recently in Bangkok, there was a conference, and uh, a colleague of mine, a very well-placed senior uh, China, Chinese scholar, uh, you know, they asked him at the end, you know, what, is your, what keeps you up at night? So he said, uh, a war in the South China Sea. Uh, South China Sea has always had some tensions, you know, uh, Spratleys uh, going back two decades. But I think that the, a, the likelihood, the plausibility and likelihood of an actual clash now is greater than, than I've seen in, in my lifetime uh, in South China Sea. Uh, you see that while the, all of this is going on, it's partly a... Uh, a pushback against China's BRI, AIB, New Development Bank. So China is making all these moves. Um, the BRI, a Belt and Road Initiative, is a kind of, uh, you know, if you look at the map, it goes, there's an overland route, uh, the 
belt and then the, uh, the, the maritime route, uh, the road, maritime silk road, uh, economic belt, overland. This is, I see this as a kind of China's uh, manifest recovery, manifest resurgence. If you, if you think of the US manifest destiny, the, the inevitability, the entitlement of expansion in the US to cover the entire continent. So China sees this as a kind of, you know, they used to be the top power in the region, they used to have an empire, only in the last 200 years that they have been subjugated, dominated by other powers. So they want to regain, this is, if you look at the map, uh, that's what's happening, this is the BRI map. Uh, at the same time, there are, I think there are other factors involved, other realities for China. They want to diversify energy sources, you know, because otherwise they are highly dependent on the Straits of Malacca. If the Straits of Malacca uh, choked off, then China will, will suffer. Uh, they also need to ex, you know, expand uh, capacity. They have a capacity uh, expansion. They want to build, uh, increase the role of uh, Chinese companies, in construction, infrastructure, and so on. And in addition, they, they want to uh, internationalize the, the, the renminbi, uh, the role of the yuan, the renminbi, the currency. Uh, so not just uh, the, the BRI on a map, but there are other uh, drivers behind the BRI. But this BRI now, for China, uh, and to me, it's kind of a, uh, there's a sense of entitlement, a sense of uh, inevitability to it. Uh, their, their rise is going to have to find more space uh, for their companies, for their people. So you see China now everywhere. Uh, especially in Southeast Asia, all the way to Africa. So that's the second point I want to make. Third point, does this mean a new Cold War? And uh, you have handouts. There are a couple of articles that, you know, my, my talk is based on the paper that I've uh, handed out. Um, a new Cold War, uh, we must not think of new Cold War as a previous Cold War between the US and USSR, but there are characteristics of great power uh, competition, rivalry, um, you know, it is a very adversarial relationship. Uh, the U.S. now sees China not as, just as a rival, I think, but now adversary, adversary. And we now have uh, statements from uh, people like Mike Pence, you know, he made this uh, uh, Hudson Institute on October 4th, uh, big speech. And that speech uh, was very confrontational, really a pushback against China, but there were two mentioned uh, two references to what the U.S. calls the whole of government, the whole of government. So they see China as a totalitarian state. This is state capitalism. So in that sense, um, it, is, it has an echo of uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union. Um, this is a titanic struggle between two superpowers. Uh, in addition, China has a socialist economy, but it has blended, it has mixed in uh, capitalism. So China unlike the USSR, is a much more formidable foe for the US um, because they can compete economically, unlike the USSR. So are we seeing a new Cold War? Uh, we don't have a, to, to call it a Cold War, but certainly the, the tensions, uh, intensifying tension, ten tensions that we're seeing, uh, the bipolarity that we're seeing, you know, it's becoming more US-China. The trade war began, uh, if, we have to, if you recall, with the solar panels and washing machines vis-a-vis -vis South Korean and Chinese. But by the mid-year, by mid-2018, it was all China. You know, the US has had this kind of trade conflict and tension with other countries before, with Japan in the 1980s, with the EU throughout. But because those were allies, in the end, there was some kind of settlement. And in the end, the Japanese uh, budged, they accommodated, you know, they revalued the, the, um, the yen, for example, in 1985. Uh, but the Chinese are not like that. They're not the U.S. ally. Uh, so this is a, I think, not, you know, we don't have to say Cold War, but the characteristics, uh, the directions, uh, the feel of it uh, is very confront confrontational and bipolar. Uh, fourth, what does it mean for ASEAN, Southeast Asia? This region, ASEAN, is now divided since 2012 particularly, but uh, this division lingers, uh, persists, and this is consequential for how ASEAN is going to have to deal with this uh, great power competition and rivalry. Uh, this is exactly the situation between the major powers that ASEAN does not want to see. ASEAN wants to see some tension between the US and China. Tension allows leverage, um, but this is too much tension now for, for ASEAN. 
and it will it will overshadow the ASEAN centrality. I, I think the FOIP is a is a uh, an endeavor enterprise that could bypass the ASEAN centrality. Certainly, could undermine it. Um, so the response from ASEAN this time this year, uh, you know, under Singapore, I think that they have managed to kind of hold its ground. And there's some signs that ASEAN is willing now to deal f to accommodate China. Uh, to a certain degree. You can see it from the Philippines to from Duterte. Uh, I think what ASEAN does not want to do is to get caught in the middle and have to choose between the US and, and China. So because China is the resident superpower, it has um, an advantage. And ASEAN therefore is, is, I think it's accommodating a little bit up to a point. It's a good time to accommodate China because China, ASEAN now has a little bit more leverage, bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis China because China is facing multiple fronts of pushback, multiple fronts. For Thailand, as ASEAN chair next year, uh, this is a very tricky, uh, risky proposition. Uh, first of all, the, the Thai domestic political situation is still uncertain. We don't know. When the election looks like it will be February 24th. The latest it could be is May 5th. Um, you know, another date would be maybe April 28th, maybe um, March 31st, so these are really the, the few dates that they can have it. February 24th will be the earliest, May 5th will be the latest. But this means that Thailand will not have an elected government in place until May at the earliest. Now, the ASEAN summit has been set for the third week of June. I think it's June 21st, 22nd, 22nd, 23rd. Uh, by that time, I don't know if Thailand will have a, a newly elected government. And I don't know, we don't know how, who's going to be the government at that time. Uh, last time Thailand chaired ASEAN 10 years ago, it was not a pleasant experience. It was not a successful chairmanship. Uh, we had a lot of uh, street protests. In the end, uh, the East Asia Summit had to be you know, disbanded and then uh, uh, postponed several times before it actually took place. Uh, so it will not be as bad as 10 years ago, but next year, uncertainty over the Thailand chairmanship. Uh, however, on a bilateral basis, Thailand now needs to to rethink and recalibrate its major power relations. Uh, since the coup very close to China, uh, some alienation with the Obama administration, but under Trump, uh, General Prayut has visited the White House, and US is a uh, Thailand is a US treaty ally. So I think Thailand, among the major powers, now is a time to recalibrate, uh, maybe to rethink and um, uh, readopt some of the uh, uh, treaty uh, alliance benefits with the U.S. because I think this bilateral confrontation is going to get uh, worse, uh, and the U.S. is going to flex a lot of muscle uh, in the coming year and throughout the Trump term. And there's a good chance Trump will be reelected. So my last point would be that uh, you know the big question is: after all we've seen and heard, this has been a very alarming, foreboding year, 2018. Uh, the year began with some tariffs on solar panels, washing machines. Is, is the year is ending with a full-fledged, full-blooded confrontation between the U.S. and China. And the U.S., uh, to me, is a given. The, the statements coming out of Pence, the President Trump, the White House, NSC, the entire apparatus, they will ramp up the, the trade uh, rhetoric, uh, protectionism, tariffs, and so on. So the question is, you know, what will China do? What will China do? And uh, from the po uh, China's posture, China, I think, is very frustrated. It feels that uh, it, you know its rise uh, is not being recognized, uh, respected. And what Xi Jinping said, and you know this APEC summit uh, in the, um, P uh, PNG in Port Moresby, uh, not a good sign. I mean, they didn't have a statement in the end, and there's a lot of uh, uh, antics, uh, theatrics with uh, between the U.S. and China. So the question to me is, to what extent will, will China budge? To what extent will China accommodate? And then related to that, of course, uh, how much further is the US going to push? They have some bilateral discussions, but the, the framework, the context is not, uh, not conducive. Uh, so I do think that in the end, China will be pragmatic. I don't think that China will go to war um, at this time. They might wait uh, until they are stronger. Uh, they might wait until the U.S. has more problems, uh, but otherwise uh, we have to worry about potential, uh, potential incidents uh, in places like the South China Sea that could lead to a wider conflict. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Dr. Teddy Nunn, for that excellent and rather sobering uh, assessment, although it's, it's a great relief that we're not going to uh, see war uh, break out uh, anytime soon, in your view. Um, so turning to Dr. Superwood, who, um, who actually is, uh, um, in my time as, a, as a, a correspondent as well, one of the most respected uh, economists in, in Thailand and, uh, and a real go-to guy for, uh, for his take on the economy. And uh, he's going to focus on the trade war and its impact and implications, I hope, on the Thai private sector, capital markets, uh, and uh, prospects for economic growth in, uh, in this kind of environment. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Gwen. Um, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, unfortunately, I, I might be even more sobering than Dr. Titinan uh, oh. talked just now. Um, from the market's perspective, of course, we are very, very focused on what we hope will happen on the 30th of November, of November at the G20 side meeting uh, where President Trump and President Xi are scheduled to meet. Now, for now, uh, the market uh, has expectations and they range from the most optimistic. This one would go as follows. Uh, President Trump and Vice President Pence are in pre-negotiation mode, sounding tough to increase leverage, but US and China really want a deal and the deal will happen. That would be the most optimistic uh, interpretation. Number two, President Trump cares only about cutting the trade deficit because he talks about the trade deficit um, all the time. And the optics of him being seen as a savvy negotiator and the Chinese will oblige him and give him the Kim Jong-un publicity moment um, <laughs> that he had. And there will be a, a sort of a deal, at least a ceasefire. That would be the sort of the medium um, main case scenario that the market is hoping for, a ceasefire, uh, economic ceasefire. And then uh, the last one, less optimist, least optimistic, the US sees China as a strategic competitor. No, maybe even a strategic adversary. Then the trade war actually um, worsens and it will take years and years to resolve. I think that's basically what um, the market is thinking and hoping to react on uh, what happens after the 30th of November at the G20 meeting. Um, I think we don't want to react to noise like that. For example, last night um, the market went up simply because Peter Navarro is not going. Um, I don't think we want to uh, just react to noise like that. So let's see, I think, let's ask what US and China really, really want. Um, now, on the U.S. side, as an aside, I must say that the U.S. team has transformed. If you remember initially, there were more globalists in the Trump team than right now. Gary Cohn is gone as economic advisor. Uh, Rex Tillerson is gone as Secretary of State. You're left only with really Steve Mnuchin and um, Larry Kudlow is um, more of a TV anchorman than an economic advisor, in my view. <laughs> Um, so, on the other side, you have uh, Mike Pompeo and John Bolton this, uh, this on the security and uh, state side. They are probably more critical of China and the threat of China to the U.S. Um, USTR Robert Lighthizer had always been against China entering the WTO since the year 2001. Peter Navarro we talked about already. And so I think the team is going to be much, much more critical to China uh, compared to any t at any time before. If you look back, for example, during the Bush years, um, the, uh, uh, the, mini the Treasury Secretary was actually the guy, the man who handles uh, US-China relations. And as you know, he's again another one of the one Goldman Sachs team always much more willing to find compromises. Again, another globalist. OK. Um, let's uh, look into more details. President Trump wants to eliminate trade deficits because he thinks deficits represent the amount that China exploits the US. Right? His thinking, I think, is in, in a way very straightforward. One dollar trade deficit is one dollar being exploited. I think that's the sense that he has. Now, 
would the Chinese oblige? I think the Chinese would be more than willing to oblige to cut the trade deficit, um, the U.S. trade deficit with China to zero. Why? Because they already have three trillion dollars of reserves. They don't need to run trade surplus anymore. Um, they have a much larger domestic economy, and they want to focus on developing the domestic economy. They're not as interested uh, anymore in that. Also, they don't want to be dependent on the U.S., um, given the, the troubles that they have. So if that's what the U.S. wants, that's what China will deliver, in my view. Now, is this what the U.S. wants from China? I think that's much more different. Um, if you think about it, and here again, I think this is where basic uh, macroeconomics comes in. The U.S. trade deficit is caused by excess U.S. demand. The U.S. economy is pretty much one where demand is so high that there's not enough supply, no, not enough output to satisfy the demand so that you have to import the excess. That's all that it is. So my argument is this. Um, it doesn't make sense for the U.S. to just want to eliminate the trade deficit with China. That attempt will be frustrated. It will not work. Therefore, what else would the U.S. want from, from the Chinese? I think the other three um, demands are much more intrinsic and I think much more plausible. China wants, uh, the U.S. wants China to no longer force technology transfer uh, for U.S. firms wanting to do business in China. Right. This one, the Chinese are probably willing to negotiate with. Um, number two, cy cyber espionage against U.S. technology must stop. Again, I think that's negotiable. Number three, the U.S. wants China to basically abandon Made in China 2025. That is, the Chinese state-backed SOE um, must not become technology superpowers. I think that's the bottom line. I'm not you know, mixing words here. Just uh, trying to cut through and get, get the, the key uh, points up across. Um, the argument had been that the, the, um, the Chinese said the U.S. had a total of 142 demands. They actually catalog the num demands, and they said well, about you know, two-thirds are negotiable and about one-third is not negotiable. I, I'll bet that they're along these lines. Now, how far will both countries go? And that's where it, the implications are going to be for the global economy. Um, unfortunately, I think they'll do whatever it takes to win the fight because it's about technological supremacy going forward which, for example, what are the key technologies going forward? I would just um, highlight three technology. 5G, um, artificial intelligence, and um, autonomous uh, vehicles. Autonomous vehicles, the key, one of the key things about autonomous vehicles is LiDAR, light detection and ranging. Think about the military application of those three. You could have pretty much um, some machine that can distinguish between a human or someone else, an enemy and someone's not an enemy, and you can direct your military force using 5G, AI, and AV, for example. So to win the technology war going forward, to be the country that set the standard on those things seems to me to be economically and strategically critical for the next superpower. And it seems the Chinese understand this and are going in that direction. The Chinese are making huge headway on autonomous vehicle, right? And they are going to try to launch 5G in competition with the U.S. So to me, the underlying um, the underlying uh, motives uh, seem to be quite compelling in this front, on this front. The Americans uh, criticized the Chinese for state-backed capitalism, as Dr. T. Denan said. Point is, does it work? Unfortunately, it does, right? 
Japan did it. Think about it. Japan did it. Korea is doing it. Right? Samsung is as competitive maybe as Apple. So it can be done. And that's why I think the Chinese want to do it. Now, um, what does that mean for the global economy? I think um, the main risk is this. The main risk is you're going to be um, splitting the global supply chain. Right? Bottom line, it seems to me that the US MCA is nothing, is really in its basics saying that um, the US is willing to have a supply chain that's, uh, with, uh, that's using Canada and Mexico. And the Chinese will probably decide that they have to have their own supply chain. They could probably build their own supply chain because 1.4 billion people is 20% of a global population, give or take. And therefore, they have the economy of scale to build their own global supply chain. And for countries like Thailand, we'll have to pick and choose which supply chain we would want to belong to. Remember what TPP was. TPP was actually to try to integrate the NAFTA to a Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific to be a part of the NAFTA supply chain. Isn't, it what, isn't that what the Japanese actually really wanted, bottom line? And that's why they wanted Thailand to join TPP, because we could be selling uh, automobile parts through TPP and then goes to NAFTA. And so for me, that's uh, the bottom line. And the problem is that if you have to, in fact, break up a global economy the way it is right now and split into two, in between doing the vacuum, you, chances are you have a recession because you will have to wait and see. And during the wait and see, the output goes down. Now, to complicated matters, and my last point is that the US is running a huge fiscal deficit. That is the other spanner in the works. The US is going to be running a, a $1 trillion or so fiscal deficit starting 2019, and then they'll keep on rising. That means the supply of US treasuries coming out it is true that at the moment there are 20 trillion US Treasury outstanding out there, but the real demand, domestic demand for US Treasury, if you subtract interagency holdings and you subtract what the Fed is holding and it's going to be selling, and you subtract um, what foreign central banks are holding, then the real demand is only about six trillion. If you add one trillion every year, to six trillion, you'll have a lot of treasury being supplied, and chances are you'll have long-term interest rates rising globally. And that would be adding to a global tightening, or a, a, at least a liquidity tightening globally. Um, uh, that, I think, unfortunately, the, the, the sums it up for me that it doesn't look good for the global economy going to 2019 and 2020. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Superwood. We're now going to turn to Ajahn Pavida, uh, who uh, will follow a view with a view on dynamics and consequences of the trade war on global, regional, local supply chains, value chains. I thought that was a very interesting point Dr. Superwood made about uh, Thailand being <coughs> having to choose, but will it be able to pick and choose which supply chain it would care to be part of? Anyway, over to you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, you may Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and your excellencies. Uh, thank you, ISIS, for having me on the panel today. Uh, it's not always easy to discuss firm or business issues on panels of ISIS because I know that it doesn't sound as sexy as uh, what countries want to do and who would gain and who would uh, lose in this kind of uh, trade war that we are talking. And, but I'm tasked to discuss more, and uh, I'm very happy that Dr. Sifu would mention that the splitting of global supply chain would be one of the key factors that determine the direction of the global economy. 
uh, how I see this issue is more complex is because when we are talking about war, trade war between US and China, but we are actually looking at uh, some level of discrepancies between winners and losers. Uh, supply chain and global value chain uh, are perfect examples. Uh, you know, the two words are used quite uh, frequently, interchangeably. Global value chains means the integration of all activities that start from the inception of the product all the way to the consumption of products and service. Whereas the global supply chain is usually referred to more in the tangible aspect of the products and goods production. So that's why uh, these two words are often used interchangeably and sometimes people also use the word global production network to refer to this kind of integration of activities that has been disaggregated uh, in countries around the world uh, over the past, I guess, four decades. And that's the response that business have responded to the globalization as we know it. But in today's world, we are talking about war between countries, whereas the two level of discrepancies that I see is that first, the actors and the impacts are not always countries. We are also looking at uh, firms and consumers that suffer. So when we say that US might win from reducing the trade deficit, but is that always the winning solution for US firms that are benefiting from their this aggregation of their global activities that allow them to have their global production network and their activities around the world? So that's already one level of discrepancy that I see. Uh, consumers in the US may also suffer from having to pay for higher costs of goods that are not supplied from the most comparative, uh, cheapest cost uh, of the country like China. But uh, US firms would have to source supplies from other countries and US consumer will uh, suffer as it is already clear. Apple has already mentioned that their phone would certainly be more expensive than it is. And that would also lead to Chinese foreign firms doing better. So is that China winning or is that US winning? So that's already the level of discrepancy that I see. And I also think that the second level of discrepancy that we are looking at this war is that we tend to look at trade wars in terms of the impact of the final products. Trump look at trade deficit as uh, U.S. winning or losing. But we know that trade flows in today's world is not driven mainly by the final goods trades, but is more intermediate products that are traded between firms and global production network and global value chain. So when you see export from China as something that hurt the U.S., you don't see that U.S actually need import because that is the input into the global production network. So I think these two levels of discrepancies undermine our discussion of the uh, trade war as we so called it right now. So when I prepare my uh, talk to perhaps bring in more issues that allow us to understand more of what is going on in terms of the decision regarding global supply chain or global value chain. I call this, uh, I am asking, we are looking at, the, is this factory China being disrupted because of this tariff that the US has imposed on, uh, on the goods that are exported from China? And we are certainly seeing that uh, People are concerned about what firms that are normally based in China, what they would do. So their factory in China is certainly being disrupted. And I have three points to, uh, to share with you today. The first is that I would uh, discuss that the factors that are already affecting global value chains. So firms are not sitting around and just looking at ways and uh, waiting for 
decision on G20. Of course, this would be a certain uh, important factor in their decision, but global value chain decisions are made in uh, boardrooms and in corporate rooms, and there are already factors that are driving changes that they are already, already looking at. I'll go into detail later. And the second point that I would like to address is uh, what are some of the directions that the global value chain reconfiguration are already taking place among lead multinational firms of the world? And would that have some kind of implication for the uh, trends that we are seeing? And the third point that I would like to address is uh, what does it mean for Thailand? What are the local implications for Thai firms and Thailand and Thai industries? So without uh, further ado, let me just talk about <clears throat> the factors that are already affecting uh, the decision regarding global value chain. We can see that uh, the first factor is that most firms are already looking for global China plus X strategy. If they are looking at uh, Asia factory production network, they are already looking for China plus one. And that plus one could be Vietnam, could be Cambodia, could be Thailand. So. Uh, and ASEAN is quite excited because this ASEAN plus one along with the US-China trade war is implying that uh, ASEAN is the direction in which uh, many of the inward direct investment might come when firms are looking to relocate their operation. So that's already one thing that is taking place. Firms are already looking for alter alternative to China because no one firms want to put their eggs in one basket. And there is already concern about uh, production being also moved to, back to more regional production. And that's because of the second factor, which is the technological advancement that we are seeing in the world. Manufacturing is not the same. Uh, when companies started to move their factories to Asia in the uh, 80s and in the 90s, that's because they were looking for cost advantage that could be re from uh, lower labor costs or from lower production costs. But technology advancement that are making those factors less important, for example, 3D, uh, 3D technology or uh, some other very advanced technology that makes the need for low cost labor less significant for firm. Automation is certainly one of that. So that is already going on. And I think that a lot of firms, even some Thai firms that are investing overseas, are even looking at investing in the US because it's not just uh, labor costs that they are looking at, but uh, more sophisticated technology as well. And the third factor from the business perspective is that the shorter demand cycle that we are seeing in many goods, uh, we might say that apparel or textile is one of the clear examples that we are seeing shorter demand cycle. That means uh, companies are trying to look for quicker response. So a longer supply chain that is spread throughout the world might not be the answer for some of the sectors. So with those three factors that are already trending in the world, what we are seeing is that the supply chain or the global value chain is becoming more regional. It's not so much that this is factory Asia exporting to the world, but it is also uh, the production that is staying within Asia, answering to the demand that is rising more from Asia. And uh, production in the, the North American answering more to, uh, to demand in North America, and the same thing for the EU. So we are already seeing that trend taking place. So the question is, what does the US and China trade war mean for this trend that is uh, already taking place? I think that uh, it's quite uh, clear that many people are looking at Southeast Asia as the region that might benefit from supply chain relocation. But I don't think that it would be easy that we can determine uh, if Thailand would be the one who benefit or if it would be Vietnam. And I think that the patterns of relocation of supply chains would differ by uh, sector and by firm as well. So it should not be only seen from the country level perspective. 
And I think that uh, we need to understand what then uh, make firms look at supply chains and look at locations when they make their decisions on uh, uh, supply chain relocation. These are not uh, short-term uh, locate decision because these are strategic location. At the same time, you might see some short-term decision of firms relocating just the final assembly point to somewhere nearby, just not to uh, round trip the uh, outside of China and be exported into the U.S. through other countries. And that might be some short term that I'm sure we would see some smaller firms that are looking at doing that just to cope with the short term implication of the tariff escalation. But I think for any firms that are looking at the uh, global value chain, they have to be thinking in the long term. And the key attractions for firms in terms of the value chain readjustment and relocation would be as follows. First, the cost advantage in uh, basic and standardized activities, and this might be applicable to industries that still need cost advantage. For example, we are already seeing uh, furniture industry or textile industry relocating to Bangladesh or to India. Uh, the article that uh, is being distributed uh, as well as the list that Nikkei Asian Review has done on the winners of losers have already indicated that those are some of the companies that might relocate and then uh, they are looking for other locations with cost advantage and that's where Vietnam comes into uh, the picture, Bangladesh comes into the picture for t apparel. But that's not, uh, the, that's not all the supply chain that is taking place in China. It would not be easy to replicate the supply chain that most firms have established in China because uh, supplier network in China are pretty sophisticated particularly in the uh, electronic and in automotive industries. And that's why you are seeing that tariffs are targeted specifically at the uh, electronics uh, companies such as firms and products. So how do countries attract sophisticated uh, supplier network? Countries would have to already have the presence of leading companies and they would have to have the uh, skilled labor and have uh, sophisticated suppliers in those countries in order to attract the kind of uh, sophisticated value-added activities that they might want that is not just uh, assembly or production for export base. And another factor that would be important is the regional market growth opportunities. And this is why the fact uh, the optimism is going toward uh, ASEAN and Southeast Asia. That's because Southeast Asia is not only a factory in the global production network, but it is also a growing uh, market. The growing middle class and then the, uh, the consumer market that is growing makes it a perfect location for companies to look at this as a place that they can locate their production network and at the same time they can serve the growing regional demand. So what does it mean for Thailand? Uh, I think Thailand has a lot of factors going forward. We are having uh, the EEC policy that the government said that it would save us for the next 20 years. And we are looking at uh, trying to attract uh, companies to come to Thailand and the EEC. But we must also realize that Thailand is not the country with the most sophisticated network and uh, supplier network that could answer to the relocation away from China to attract the more advanced uh, level activities from multinational companies. We still don't have the most sophisticated uh, infrastructure network to distribute our goods throughout CLMV. Although the plans are there, the fact of the borders, the transaction between borders are still one issue that face uh, an increased cost for companies. So for Thailand to uh, benefit more from this, I think it remains in our own homework to make sure that our supplier become much more sophisticated in terms of being able to attract the kind of inward investment that we want to attract. 
And I also see that the another trend that uh, we have not talked about as much as uh, that is the outward foreign direct investment that is going from this region. I think we have been looking at the uh, relocation of uh, foreign investors away from the US or away from China into this country. And I think that we must not forget that with the tariff war being escalated uh, in those countries, it also allows opportunities for companies who want to jump the tariff war to go and uh, invest in those countries. So I would not be surprised to see that some of the firms that could see opportunities from opportunities to go invest in China and opportunities to go invest in the US in order to serve the market that is already there and that companies do not want to lose. So uh, I know that uh, these are not very sobering. Uh, it doesn't reflect my mood because I think that uh, these are some of the consideration that multinational firms are looking at. But when you look at the kind of the uncertainties that we are seeing in the global economy because of this escalating trade war between the two giants, you cannot avoid uh, seeing that with the dampening of the confidence of consumer, that would certainly be a major factor for all companies that are depending on the major export market. And Thailand is no exception. So countries that are export dependent are likely to be hurt by this kind of dampening confidence that is taking place because two of the biggest power in the world are at war with each other. So I think although there are opportunities for firms, uh, overall it's not an easy environment for firms to navigate. And these things would also take long term. So I agree with Dr. Superwood that perhaps in the short term we are seeing uh, some kind of a slowdown of the global economy when firms are also readjusting their global value chain strategy. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, uh, Dr. Pavita, for an uh, excellent rundown. And uh, now.